Good day YouTube. Warbles on a lot here. For those of you familiar with the channel, those of you who were watching yesterday's video will be aware that at the moment we're organising a funeral for my mum. The funeral will be tomorrow, which is, uh, let's see, today's the 18th, tomorrow will be the 19th. At 2.30 at the Cameron Memorial Uniting Church in Glen Innes. Well, yesterday with my daughter, I was going through some photos, coming up with a bit of a slideshow montage for the service. Apparently, there's a technical difficulty and the actual display won't probably be very big, so you, most of the people in the church won't be able to make out too many details. And I'm going to have to get up and say a few words over the old girl's coffin. So, I don't know, to get my head in, in tune with the task, I'm going to have a crack at a uh, YouTube video slideshow just running through the photos. And uh, I don't know whether what I say today is going to be what I'm going to say tomorrow. And It's a kind of a prickly story to tell because various people have different perspectives on it. Because uh, although in her later years she was a pillar of the community and all the rest of it, when she came to town... She sort of scandalised society. Um, and 63 years is a long time to live in a country town and most of the people who were around at the time of the scandal aren't any longer there. Um, so it, it might come as a shock to some people to know that my mother scandalised the society of Glen Innes, but the long and the short of it, the, the broad coverage of, of the scandal goes like this. My father's first wife died in October 1958. My big sister was due to be married a fortnight after her mother died, because people die on their schedule, not on the calendar. So Betty's wedding, that's my big sister Betty, was postponed by six months. And they could sort out the funeral and all the rest of it. And then after they got over the death, then they could have the wedding. Right. That's part one of the story. Part two of the story is my mother had trained as a fashion and design teacher at East Sydney Tech. She'd spent four years doing it. And because it was a four-year course at a time when teaching was a three-year course in the teachers' colleges, therefore, according to the Department of Education, she was more highly qualified than somebody who was merely qualified to teach high school science, for example. Which was curious, because my mother left school at age 15 to go for four years to study sewing. But it meant that she was officially qualified to teach anybody and up to including adults at TAFE level, or technical college level. So she comes to Parks for her first assignment, two years. Broken Hill for two years. Those time frames are plucked out of my mind, so they're probably iffy, but the fact is she graduated in 1955 and she came to Glen Innes to start being the tech teacher at Glen Innes, Inverell and Tenterfield, living at the Glen Innes Country Women's Association Mountain Home, which was cheap accommodation for single women in Glen. Um, and she would either drive to Inverell to give lessons or she would catch the black and white bus to Inverell or she would drive to Tenterfield or catch the bus to Tenterfield. So she was living in Glen Innes and commuting, and she was young and she was single. And as you've seen by the wedding photos, or you will see by the wedding photos, she was never one of the standard model slim women of the 1950s. My mother was always a bit on the chubby side. Okay, so she comes to town, and in those days there was no television. What young women in Glen Innes did for kicks, amusement, interest, curiosity, they went around the churches and watched each other get married on the weekends, truly. So my mother walks from the CWA Mountain Home up to the Cameron Memorial Presbyterian Church, as it was in those days, to watch Betty Wharton getting married. You know, she was one of the gawpers standing on the other side of the road, looking at the dresses, looking at the wedding car and all the rest of it. 
My sister then moved to Grafton to live with her husband. My youngest sister went to live with big sister Betty because Betty had been looking after Sue all the while during their mother's illness. Sue was kind of like Betty's pet baby toy doll fantasy. Um, and my brother, well, he was an apprentice line technician with the Postmaster General's department. He wanted to go out with the boys and party. He didn't want to live back at home with his father, two men trying to batch and all the rest of it. So he went out and lived in a boarding house. My father had never lived on his own in his whole bloody life. He went from his mother's house to get married and then his wife died and his family moved away. So he closed up the family home. He went to live in a boarding house run by a lady called Mrs. Berman. And Mrs. Berman was learning to sew. Therefore, Mrs. Berman, in a gesture of friendship, decided to invite the new sewing teacher home to the boarding house for Saturday lunch, I think it was. Maybe it was a Sunday lunch, but anyway. To cast her eye across the potential eligible bachelors in town, because that's how women in the 1950s and 60s ran their lives in Glen Innes. There was apparently... Um, Quite some serious thought being given among the widows and spinsters of the town as to who would have the best chance at making a run on Eric Wharton because he was a fairly eligible, successful businessman at the time. You know, his first family had grown up and moved away. He had an engine reconditioning business. He owned his own house in town. He had a holiday house at the coast. He had a couple of cars. He was... He was someone to bear in mind if you were a middle-aged woman who didn't have a husband, for whatever reason. War widow, car accident widow. Remember, there was no random breath testing in those days. There was no seat belts in those days. There was no speed limit on the, on the highway between towns. There, there was a lot of spinsters, widows, older women who were looking for a bloke 50 years old who was well-established. My mother goes to the meeting at the, the boarding house. She hears my father is going to Grafton either the next day or the next weekend to take a load of furniture to my sister in his Volkswagen 35 horsepower utility truck, 1956 vintage. And my mother had heard many stories of the Glen Innes to Grafton Road told by her father because before the First World War he'd been driving the Tenterfield to Casino solid tired mail coach and he knew all of the back roads around here and he had stories about all of them. So my mother invites herself along on the trip to Grafton to look at the old Grafton Road or in those days it was the highway so to look at the Grafton Road. Listen to the bellbirds, have a look at the tunnel, pick fruit from the wild fruit trees growing in the S-bends, hairpin bends, all that which means that a month, six weeks after she'd got married, my sister in Grafton is confronted with her father figure chug, chug, chugging up the driveway in his truck with a 22-year-old tech teacher on the passenger seat. Needless to say, Bet Bet was not amused. I never got to call her Bet Bet. That's what my brother and other sister called her because she was the eldest. They were little kids. Little kids quite often can't pronounce things right. I don't know whether it was Betty or Robert or Sue, but they tagged my father's father, Nandy, because they couldn't say Grandpa when they first started talking to him. Anyway, big sister Betty wasn't amused, and conflict lines were drawn up between her and my mother, and the war went for 63 years. They never quite forgave each other for existing or having anything to do with my father or, you know. Personally, I've been the stepfather from hell and I don't begrudge my stepsons anything they ever did to try and give me the shits when I was living with their mother because that's just the nature of that relationship. My mother never really understood that. She couldn't really see why her stepchildren had any reason to resent her relationship with my father. And I think that was just foolish, self-centered, ill-considered, unwise. In all respects, it was an immature expectation on my mother's part. But 
that was what she wanted to think and that's what she did think right up until she died. And, you know, my big sister, determinedly upholding her idea of what should have happened, um, she kept Robert and Sue in her corner, being loyal to the memory of their mother. And, yeah, it was, it was, it was not fun to grow up as the rotten, spoiled brat of the wicked, evil stepmother, but that was my status. Meanwhile, all of the people in town who had been social friends with my father and his first wife, they tended to withdraw from my father and his second wife. There were a few. Um, Bill Sharman and his wife, they, they stuck by Dad after he, he married my mother. Um, Eric Hogman and his wife, they stuck by Dad and, and, and were welcoming to my mother and me. Um, Jeff Callaghan in Sydney, he, he was a Glen Innes boy and, and yeah, he was always welcoming to Dad and Mum. But most of the people in Glen Innes back in 1960, 65, they sort of backed off. But Mum was a school teacher, so she was plugged into the school teacher's social network. And that meant that Dad got plugged into the school teacher's social network because the schoolies all go and, well, they used to, have dinner parties at each other's house. In fact, in the late 60s, early 70s, they had what they called progressive dinners where they would all show up at one person's house for pre-dinner drinks and horses doovers or doves and they'd sink a couple of drinks and get in their cars and drive on to the next place and there they'd have their entree and a few drinks and drive on to the next place for the main course and a few more drinks and drive on to the next place for a few drinks and dessert and drive on to the next place for a few more drinks and and coffee and yeah teachers progressive dinners in the 1970s they'd roll on home sometime after midnight so dad had a social network but he was plugged into the Leninist teachers spouses social network because yeah a lot of people just couldn't get their head around the idea of him taken up with a woman 28 years younger but it was legal. You know, when I was born, mum was 24 and dad was 52. So over the years, it became normalized. The people who were outraged got used to it or they moved out of town or they died of old age. Um, Betty, Robert and Sue, they all moved out of town and went and made lives for themselves somewhere else. And, uh, I tell people to this day that one of the reasons I get along as well with my kids as I do is because I never, ever inflicted a daddy's new girlfriend fantasy onto them, let alone daddy's new wife. Because I've been a stepfather, I watched my mother, well, initially I can remember when she was trying hard to make it work as a stepmother, and, and then I watched her dig a little toes in and behave as if, right, you want to fight over this, I will use every power in my possession to make sure that you do not kick me out of my relationship with my husband. That was her point of view, and she played that corner very hard. But so did my sister. I can vividly remember how down in the mouth Dad would get when he'd come home from buying the paper on a Wednesday and a loaf of bread on a Tuesday, or Thursday and Tuesday, and both times when he was in the main street, he would have been approached by one of his first wife's close friends to tell him how good his grandchildren were looking on the weekend, because my sister who lived in Grafton had a husband, and the husband owned the left-hand front leg of a racehorse, and the racehorse lived in Burrell. So to visit the left-hand front leg of the racehorse and pat it and tell it to win at the next race, they'd have to go through Glen Innes. And on the way through, they would stop to visit one of Betty's mother's friends and have a cuppa, and then they'd go over and play with the racehorse, stay the night in Inverell, and then they'd come back through Glen Innes and they'd visit another one of Betty's mother's friends. So, yeah, the old man would find out on Tuesday and Thursday how good his grandchildren looked because his eldest daughter did not drop in and visit him 
because she did not approve of his choice in second wife. I mean, it was a vicious bloody fight. <coughs> My youngest sister was unable to deal with the cognitive dissonance, so she just kind of kept her distance. My brother, well, he's been up here about seven times that I can think of, and he never tells you when he's coming, so twice he showed up here to visit me from Melbourne, and I wasn't here on the day. You know, I come home from town and find there's a bottle of wine beside me, me front door because you know, Bugs has been for a visit. That was his nickname, Bugs Wharton. And until I was born, he was the black sheep of the family. And until he came along, Dad's little brother was the black sheep of the family. And before Spencer, actually it was Dad's father who was the black sheep of the family because he was a coach builder and wheelwright, whereas all the rest of my great-grandfather's children were school teachers. They were properly respectable. And it wasn't considered quite right to be a coach builder. But that's what my grandfather was. Anyway, maybe the, well, some people would say my daughter is the black sheep of the family, but I love her. I reckon she's great. And my son is the pillar of the community, so something worked out somewhere. And, yeah, because I get along pretty well with my youngest sister and my brother, when my cousin told me that you're not allowed to talk to your brother or your sisters unless you have a lawyer present, I waited for her to get out of sight of me, and I rang up my brother to tell him that my mother was in hospital and she was dying which shocked him and freaked him out. And, you know, he had COVID and I had COVID and we swapped COVID stories over the phone and all the rest of it. And uh, then I rang my younger sister and told her and, and she was you know, pretty shocked and surprised because, you know, haven't heard from her for about seven or eight years, maybe 10 years. Haven't seen the big sister for 25 years. But anyway... Um, Robert and Sue must have said something to Betty. And apparently Betty's been a widow for seven years and she's had time to think stuff through. And She's now about 83 years old, so she's getting on in years. And most people look back on their lives and they figure out stuff that they did, that they were certain of and sure of at the time, but in, in, in hindsight doesn't look so clever. And big sister Betty must be at that point because... I got a phone call from her on Monday night. I've never had a phone call from Betty. <laughs> I'm, I'm only 61. I haven't seen her for 25 years. And before that, last time I saw her was at Dad's funeral. Yeah. Yeah. Betty Lawson climbed down, back down far enough to ring me up and offer condolences on my mother's death and to apologise for all the bad stuff that she did. So she's woken up to herself. It means that my mum, finally, the day she died, the surrender letter came in from Big Sister. So anyway, that's why on the brochure given out at the funeral and on the death notice in the main street, I managed to hammer my cousin from Sydney into submission and get it through that you know, regardless of my mother's desire to sweep any of her failures under the carpet she was stepmother to Betty, Robert and Sue and it was a turbulent attempt at being the stepmother and she didn't like it and she, she didn't like to talk to them or about them or have me talk to them or about them or think about them at all but in the final finish, they admitted that she had nothing to apologise for. It was lawful for my mother to marry my father despite the extreme age gap between them. If that's what they wanted to do, they were entitled. I think they, they had reason to regard my mother as a gold digger. You know, she came to a little country town. She managed to marry an established businessman who'd been recently widowed. And when Dad died, he left his estate 
to be divided equally among his four children, but his wife had the use of his estate until she died. So she couldn't spend the capital, but she could invest it and use the interest accrued by his estate. So it said in the main part of his will, but there was an escape clause, which entitled my mother as executor of dad's estate, if she was in sufficiently difficult circumstances, she could actually access all of my father's estate and spend it for whatever purpose she wanted. So yeah, my, my siblings read that part 40 years ago and they immediately consigned any hope of seeing any money from dad's estate to the garbage bin. They figured that's it, you know, she's got legal right to spend that money as she sees fit. So that's the end of it. That, so they thought, we've never spoken about it. I assumed that they would expect my mother to keep the money intact. Any time she come up with any devious underhanded scheme to tap those funds for some purpose that I thought wouldn't stand up to the sniff test, I pulled her into line and made a toe that line and I wouldn't, wouldn't countenance any silly buggery with Dad's estate money. So my brother didn't quite burst into tears when I mentioned to him that, oh yeah, by the way, I made sure that she kept all the money from the estate of E.J. Wharton in a separate account and it's all still there. And uh, you know, yesterday I went to see the son of my father's solicitor because Henry Liston's dead as well. And uh, I asked his painted secretary to dig out the Ouija board, and get in contact with the spirit of Henry Liston and see if you can find the will of E.J. Wharton because you're going to have to look up my sister because she becomes the executor of my father's will after my mother dies and my mother died on Monday morning. Which means that there should be something in the order of $200,000 to be split equally among the four of us 40 years after we buried my father. And I can tell you, Betty, Robert and Sue were not actually expecting that. Because in their mind, my mother was a much bigger bitch than she actually ever was. I'm not saying they didn't have reason to think that she was a bitch. Because she could be. She could be an absolute bulldozer of a woman. Once she got an idea into her head, she would grip it by the teeth and just go with it. And nobody could dissuade her of anything different. Um, and because she left school at 15 to go to East Sydney Tech, she didn't actually have a whole lot of higher education. She was qualified to teach adults. She once spent three months as the science master of the high school, but she just walked into the class and told the kids to open the book to page such and such and read this and there'll be a test on Friday. Because she didn't ever study that stuff. Possibly the saddest story she used to tell, wrongfully, concern history and family history. At some point, her mother told me a fairy story about her umpty ump great ancestor having been given a castle in Ireland because of all the help he gave Bonnie Prince Charles at the Battle of Culloden. My mother heard her mother say it. She heard her mother tell me the story. My mother believed it. I was raised on that particular grandmother story and I thought it sounded a bit squiffy. You know, the, the, it was a bit like castles in Spain or, you know, like if I go back to Poland, or, or, or I'm a baronet. So I didn't really trust it, which was good. It was really good because there, there came a time when I was trying to so, save the world's problems with poetry and I was being entertained and accommodated by the New England Medieval Art Society, living in a Viking longhouse reconstruction, cooking in a hole in the ground. And my hosts were a bunch of um, New England University history students and professors and all the rest of it and of course they asked me what my white collar backstory was and luckily I prefaced it by saying well this is the grandmother story I was raised on but I've never known whether I should believe it because it sounds too good to be true and I've told them the story about Bonnie Prince Charles and Sir Samuel King helping Bonnie Prince Charles at Culloden and therefore he had a castle in Ireland and I could see by the looks on their face that you know, the grandmother story was sitting in the middle of the campfire like a great big steaming turd and, and nobody knew what to say about it. Eventually the lead professor said to me, well, I, I really think you should uh, 
visit a library and look up some history of the Battle of Culloden and, and you'll be able to work it out for yourself. They were too kind to tell me what a crock of shit my mother had raised me to believe. And when I read a few history books on the Battle of Culloden, I was horrified. Now, I don't know whether my grandmother knew the truth or whether she had grown up with her own level of absolute bullshit family stories thinking it was all real. I spent 20 years trying to explain to my mother that this is a story you should never, ever tell. You should certainly never tell it in Glen Innes because Glen Innes with its Celtic standing slivers up on top of Martin's Lookout and its annual Celtic Clowns in Kilts convention, it's probably got one of the higher concentrations of Celtic history buffs, of people who know the names of the people who were tied to a tree and shot for having fought with Bonnie Prince Charles at the Battle of Culloden. Prince Charles lost at the Battle of Culloden. Nobody who was any help to Bonnie Prince Charles received anything except a, a death sentence or penal servitude for life. But I, I couldn't get it through to her. I don't know how many people have bitten their tongue and just let her rabbit on with crap that she thought was meaningful and real and convincing because she didn't have the education. She was bluffing. She came to town as the tech teacher and therefore she was automatically, by the social standards of Gleninus, she was promoted to the same level as everybody else who had tertiary qualifications. The accountants, the doctors, the lawyers, the high school teachers, she had parity with them. And she never backed away from any of it. She played the hand that she was dealt and she played it brilliantly. There, there were people who never knew that she left school at 15 because she mixed with the upper crust. She came to town as a tech teacher and she was told on her way to her first appointment in Glen Innes, Inverell and Tenerfield that those tech colleges are going to close due to lack of enrolments. So you won't be there very long. You'll have to you know, go there and close those colleges down and then come back to Armadale. My mother's father, the First World War pilot, he managed to have a job created for him because my grandmother sent a letter to a politician and the politician's secretary sent it to the Sydney Morning Herald who printed it in the letters column and the politician was so terribly embarrassed by the jobs for the boys that he'd promised people like my grandfather after the First World War. And once he got elected, he didn't come up with any jobs and when he saw Alice Cruz's letter in the newspaper, yeah, my father suddenly got, uh, my grandfather got suddenly taken on as a New South Wales government driver. He drove the politicians around, which meant that my mother, growing up during World War II, you know, she was three when the war broke out. She grew up on a diet of pure propaganda and high voltage connections to the New South Wales government. At the time when they thought the Japanese were going to invade Sydney, they were making preparations for an alternative seat of government at Parks. My grandfather had his family car, fueled, stocked, loaded, ready to go. And the plan was that when government convoy came out of Sydney, headed west, he was going to ring his wife and she was going to drive from Rossburn Avenue down to the highway and she was just going to tack on behind the government convoy and they were going to go to parks. Paperwork be buggered, permission to move be buggered, all of that, you know, secret. No, Grandpa was going to get his family out. And my mother grew up talking to all these politicians, you know. She was her cruiser's daughter, Mari. You know, she was doing sewing. So she had connections in all the political parties. And when she went to Glen Innes and Tenerfield and Inverell, well, she got on to Colonel Brux, uh, Bruxner, Tim Bruxner's father. Tim Bruxner, the famous, spent 30 years asleep in Parliament Bruxner. Oh, his father was a World War I veteran. My grandfather was in the Australian Flying Corps. They met at various 
parliamentary events and they knew each other. So she got on to Colonel Bruxner and told him the story of how they wanted to close the TAFE because there was, or the Tech College, because there was not enough enrolments. So Colonel Bruxner got onto his National Party chain of command and he commanded that everybody who was in the National Party have their wife go and enrol in a sewing course at either Inverell or Tenterfield or Glen Innes. So not only did the enrolments bounce out through the roof, but everybody who was enrolled was connected to the political hierarchy. So yeah, Glen Innes has still got a TAFE, Inverell still got a TAFE, I don't know whether Tenterfield still got a TAFE. But the old girl, that was her first professional act when she came to town in 1959, was to save the tech college from being closed because there weren't enough enrolments. Second thing she did was use a connection from the sewing class to run into my father and set her life on a whole different path. So when she came to town, the word she taught me to use as a kid, she was a floaty. A floaty is somebody who did not go to the local kindergarten when they were a child. They've moved to town at some point after kindergarten because it's in kindergarten that the children form their little cliques. The sheep farmer's kids hang together, the cattle farmer's kids hang together, the shop owner's kids hang together, the shop assistant's kids hang together, the teacher's kids hang together, the doctor's kids hang together, the policeman's kids hang together. All these cliques are formed in kindergarten. And anybody who comes two years later is a Johnny come lately who doesn't have the same shared memories and they can never quite plug in at the same level. So mum, as a new arrival, as she called herself, because she'd married an old local, and an old local is somebody whose parents went to the same kindergarten. Not to be confused with an original settler. Original settlers are people who are still living on a land grant made to their family before New South Wales became a self-governing colony in 1872. Thus are the gradations in Glen Innes local, old local, original settler society. So my mother was a new arrival because she didn't go to kindergarten at the school that she taught at. I, who went to that kindergarten, I was an old local because my father went to that kindergarten. And she used to joke her whole life that you know, she's lived in Glen Innes since 1959, but she's not a local and she won't become a local until we bury her in the cemetery. Because that's how you can tell the difference between a new arrival and a floaty and a local. Floaties can come and become new arrivals, and new arrivals can become locals, but they don't become locals until they die living in the town. My mother-in-law, for example, left Germany, went to England to live, left England, came to Sydney to live, left Sydney, followed her daughter to Glen Innes to live, built a house in Glen Innes, and she was a floaty. Oh, I've joined a lot of organisations and, and you know, got kicked out of one or two for pension stuff. But anyway, yeah, she was trying very hard to consider herself a local. But she wasn't allowed to import squirrels to make the place feel more like Germany. And then my father-in-law died. And within a year, my mother-in-law had sold up and gone back to Germany so that she could live in the remains of the Third Reich. Because she was... Born in 1930, she was three when Adolf Hitler came to power. She grew up in Der Third Reich. And since she went back to Germany, she's been through two boyfriends who were Third Reich vintage. She floated into town, tried to connect to all of the social groups, found that she couldn't force her way in, and she floated out again. A lot of people come to Glen Innes as floaties, call themselves locals, get very, very active, and then they float out again. They decide they want to go somewhere else to retire. My mother almost did it. There was a time, 10, 15 years ago, where she was going to sell up and move down to Foster Pacific Farms because her middle sister was living there. Other times she was going to move back to Sydney because her elder sister was there. Well, Auntie Lane in Sydney has been dead, oh, must be seven years. And Auntie Lee... Oh, she had meningitis once upon a time back in the 1950s or 60s and she must have used up all her cerebral DNA repair mechanisms. 
because when her husband died, man, she just dived straight into senile dementia and she's been contracted up into a fetal position in a nursing home for, again, must be seven years. So my mother was kind of the ranking matriarch of her family as her brother had died. And, uh, yeah, yeah, she was a very determined woman who knew her own no, so to speak. One of a favourite saying among, among my mother and her sisters is, my mind is made up, please don't try to confuse me with the facts. I don't know whether somebody told Donald Trump about my mother's attitude to life, but he seems to have a pretty good grip on that particular phrase as well. Um, so yeah, yeah, she was a complicated person. She lived a complicated life in her own mind. She was absolutely trying to do the best on all occasions. Some of her students loved her. Some of her students hated her guts with a passion. One of the reasons I was so glad to be shipped off to boarding school was because I was living in fear and trembling of having to go to the high school where I would no longer be a teacher's kid at the school. And I had been informed in no uncertain terms by some of the people who were waiting to get even with me when I went to the high school. Well, they missed out because I got shipped off to boarding school. And then nearly two years later, the boarding school closed and everybody at the high school had been raised on the threat of boarding school. If you don't do what you're told, you will be sent to boarding school. You know, the dreaded threat. Behave or else. And here's me, Muggins, returning to the local high school because I went to boarding school and the school stopped. So they thought I must be some kind of a tough bloke and I went from being at the bottom of the heap getting bullied because nowhere in this childhood of mine did I ever learn to fight. How do you learn to fight if your mother's a school teacher and you're an only child? No one picks you on you at school. You've got no one to fight with at home. Go to boarding school and start shooting off your smart ass loud mouth. Yeah. My first learning experience was with a bloke called Weewack. He was called Weewack because that's where his father was an unarmed combat instructor with the Royal Australian Army. Shit, didn't I have a learning curve that day? But anyway, when I was at Glenninus High School, yeah, everybody thought I was tougher than the Fonz. A couple of years before the Fonz was on TV, but yeah, that's that, that was my status. And then I got shipped to another boarding school. And all I had to do was talk tough, because I knew how to do that by then. So, yeah, learning to fight was nothing I ever did. Instead, I learned to be verbally vicious, chop people to shreds with what I said about them and say it faster than they could think up a reply. Which meant I could talk my way into jobs and talk my way out of jobs. But that's who I was raised to be. That's, you know, as I said, the, the spoiled brat of the town's odd couple. That's how the town saw us. And the spoiled brat of the wicked evil stepmother, which is how my siblings treated us. It's, it's been a funny life, I can tell you. It's been a very funny life. Um, but anyway, this was going to start out as a photo slideshow rather than a, a great big long speechification, the camera running through all of the stuff I'm going to have to somehow knock into socially acceptable shape for tomorrow at the church. And hopefully, Mum's favourite niece, my cousin the jeweller's wife, will by tomorrow at the church have forgiven me for um, oh, not quite blowing me fuses, but I, I, I did let some of the steam come out of my ears yesterday when she was trying to tell me how I'm not permitted to mention my brother and sisters at all, and oh, but Mari wouldn't have wanted, you know, Mari's dead. And you know what, Sue? You've already buried your mother, so it's my turn now. We'll see how we go with that can't say I blame me cousin either because she's only ever heard my mother's one-sided partisan coloured textured view of events and in my mother's view of events she suffered for 60 years of the Whartons trying to 
dig her out of the relationship in the last 40 years is after their father's died and one of the things mum said when I came home for dad's funeral was that their mother was married to my father for 19 years and she was married to my father for 22 years so who was his number one wife it's a bloody good point isn't it it is a bloody good point who has the right to say that their mother was my father's legitimate wife how long was he married to who the people get themselves into a fight and they're so fixated on maintaining the fight that they don't think about the issue they're fighting over. I'm pretty sure my cousin Sue has never talked to my sister Sue or my brother Robert, let alone my sister Betty. Yet, before my mother finished dying, she was ready to tell me that I'm not allowed to talk to my siblings unless I have a solicitor present to maintain my mother's war with my big sister. And then I'm in the shit when I told her to, you know, forget that whole idea in much stronger terms than that. I figure I get to accept the surrender. And I did expect, accept the surrender. And I'm bloody glad that Betty has woken up to herself and backed down and accepted the fact that it's not her decision what our father did with his love life. I don't tell my kids who they're allowed to shack up with or marry. <laughs> They wouldn't tell me I'm not allowed to have a girlfriend, but if they didn't approve of it, they just wouldn't hang around me. So anyway, let's go and have a look at some photos. And first things first, the sympathy cards have started to come in. My next door neighbor, Pauline Williamson, Managed to surprise me yesterday by sending her grandson Charlie up on his motorbike to deliver this yesterday at sundown. Thank you Pauline and Charlie and Andrew and Elizabeth and Anna and I forget the name of Anna's other boy. And yeah, I'm not going to try and rattle off the names of all their kids and grandkids. But yeah, I'm, I'm deeply touched and grateful that they soon as they heard they were up here with a sympathy card i like that thank you very much so we have <clears throat> my mother with my daughter and my son 20 odd years ago photo taken by my mother's sister auntie lee she's the one who's slowly not yet dead from senile dementia we should be in the photo montage mum and dad being married at burwood in 1960 by the same minister who christened my mother when she was a baby. On the steps of the church, big fellow there is my uncle Bert. He's dead. My dad, yeah, he died 40 years ago. Mum's father and mother on the steps behind him. Of course, they're all dead. Mum, she's now dead. Dot Corrie, mum's bridesmaid, one of the East Sydney Tech sewing teachers. And my sister Sue, no, sorry, my cousin Sue. Bloody Freudian slip, that one. She's the one who wanted me to continue the argument with my brother and sisters. So, yeah, there they are. Husband and wife, January 1960. My brother Robert was at the wedding. Dad's sister, Auntie Doris, and her husband Thomas. He was one of the rats of Trebrook, actually. My cousin Richard Tooker, my youngest sister Sue. Mum and Dad ready to set out for their honeymoon. And that's my dad. 51 years old on his honeymoon, 1960. For the sake of the family continuity, my father's father, Stanley Clough Wharton. The coach builder and wheelwright who was considered the black sheep of the family because all of his siblings were school teachers. This is his sister, Auntie Ruby, the music teacher. She taught Peter Allen how to play the piano in Armadale. Get that one through your heads. And that's me coming home to 16 William Street, Glen Innes, when I was six weeks old. Having made my first flight on a DC-3. 
and you can believe it or not, but I can remember a couple of flashbacks from that BC-3. Now there's my little sister, 13 years old with me in 1961. I'm pretty sure these were taken with my mother's box brownie black and white Instamatic camera, that's me and my father. Yeah, my first or second trip to the beach, probably my second I think. Yes, that's my second trip to the beach, because that's the first trip to the beach. I think that might be on the Red Rock headland. And it's labelled Chris's first and second trip to Red Rock. Playing with me sister. And yeah, mate, I owned the whole beach. You just asked me. Now here we have Mum's father taking me to see Fort Denison, Taronga Park Zoo, and Sydney University because he reckoned I needed to grow up to go to university because he once was billeted at Oxford University when he was uh, he was posted to the number two school of military aeronautics in 1918. And that's me on a white horse that used to roam freely around Red Rock. It belonged to the keeper of the tick gate. And I'm standing there with my big sister's husband, Roderick Lawson. He was the bloke who was getting married when my mother was standing across the road from the Presbyterian Church to watch Betty Wharton get married in 1959. Me and me sister, me and me sister. My grandparents with their eldest daughter and their eldest two grandchildren. Photo taken by my uncle Dick. He was the American serviceman that Auntie Lane married when she was in the Women's Royal Australian Air Force. They went to America to live, but it was up to shit. They really hated it. Couldn't stand it. Freezing cold, no work, and they come back to Australia. He died just before my mother's father died. And that's me on the laundry step as a kid. This is in the backyard of the Slee family. When I was six months old, my mother had to go down to Sydney for six weeks to have her gallbladder out because she'd been pretty sick during the pregnancy and she just got worse after the pregnancy. There are all sorts of complicated reasons for that. But Dad had his workshop to run and Sue had to go to school and I was a newborn baby, so I was put into informal foster care with the Slee family, who were hard-working, honest, blue-collar family. They, they became my foster family. And, uh, yeah, long stories there. I often talk about how it used to snow in Glen Innes. This is me, maybe two or three, playing in the snow. Somebody had a crack at building a snowman for me. Not a very big one, but it is a snowman. And then, I think this must be 1964, because that was the year we got three foot of snow and lay around for a week. And this would have been on the first morning of the big snow. And it would be my sister Sue who built that snowman. Big sister Betty with her firstborn, Karen. Uh, I think I'm 18 months older than Karen. So Karen must be about six months old in that photo, and I'm probably about two. Which is around about the time Bugs Wharton got married. That's my brother Robert with his Mrs. Margaret. Yeah, I was a, quite into playing hard in them days. And... Because my grandfather flew in the First World War and he died when I was three and he was, you know, the centre of my universe at the time. Yeah, that's me wearing his Sam Brown belt and his solar topee and a set of jodhpurs that God knows why I had jodhpurs when I was three years old. But I did. Yeah, me playing in a swimming pool in Rhonda Griffith's mother's backyard. And that's my niece Karen, big sister Betty's baby. 
Yeah, I had a hat fetish from an early age, didn't I? And my mother, the sewing teacher, the Elna sewing machine sales lady, she was right into using the pre-programmed disc embroidery features to make clothes for me that would showcase how good the Elners were. Dad bought a Mercedes in 1966 or 67. And here he is pictured beside a Mercedes, but this is not his Mercedes. His Mercedes was a it was a 63E or something, and it had round headlights. This is somebody else's Mercedes. I don't know why he's photographed beside that Mercedes, but it's not his. That's me and my father and my dog, a pedigreed fox terrier whose name was Snifter. And my sister being a showgirl, and me on my first day in kindergarten. I was particularly proud and pleased with the uniform because it didn't have bloody sailing boats or puppy dogs or something embroidered all over it. 1966. Yeah, sitting very straight. And I was particularly good at smiling with my mouth shut because if I opened my mouth, you could see I had no front teeth. A legacy of the week when I was 18 months old, when I didn't like what was going on at William Street, and I tried to run away from home and go back to Ivy's place, to the foster family. And in running away from William Street, I fell down the front steps coming off the front veranda. Twice. Each time I broke a different front tooth out. Necessitating a trip to Inverell to be held in the chair by three adults while the dentist extracted the broken stump. And that taught me not to run away from home until I was at least three when I could walk without falling over and trouble is at that stage I wasn't allowed cross roads. So the next time I went to run away when I was about this age, I went three times around the block before giving up on it because the world was bounded by bitumen and eventually I had to go home for lunch. We'll get back to that photo, I've got a better copy of it in the other packet. And here is that better version. Like I said. These two women hated each other with a deep and lasting passion. And from a personal point of view, that is one of the very, very few photos of me where I still have teeth. Because I'd grown them and I hadn't yet broken them out. There's another one in the William Street backyard with the Elna embroidery all over the homemade clothes. That would be before my mother went back to teaching, which she did when I was about three. And she did that because when she was first married, she was a teacher and she had the whole social circle of the teachers to move around in. When she come home from Sydney with a baby, then suddenly she was a housewife with a baby. Um, my grandfather's second wife, lady I called Auntie Jess was very helpful to her but most of the town sort of held back and kept their distance and she was particularly lonely and trying to live up to all the idealised white picket fence standards of, of how to be a woman in Australia in 1960 or so you can see she's wearing white cotton gloves That'll be to go to church on a Sunday or something. She grew up in an era when any well-to-do woman in Australia went out in public wearing white cotton gloves to keep the moon tan in because if you didn't wear gloves, then you would get suntanned and you might look like you had a touch of the tar brush or something. It's, it's the way their headspace worked back then. And I don't know whether she bought that hat or whether she made it because she had studied millinery as part of the fashion and design studies at East Sydney TAFE. She was a very accomplished craftswoman. And here it is, the fabulous legendary photo of my father's happy family's fantasy. What we have here is my grandmother, mum's mother. Then there's my mother beside her. Then there's big sister Betty, there's my brother Robert and his wife Margaret. 
And they were about to go to Venezuela to live for two years. They had a son, Gregory, but he's not in the photo because he was a baby in nappies and probably asleep. Then we have Rod Lawson, the fellow who was standing beside me on the white horse. His kids, Andrew and Karen. Me and my father. And Sue and her then fiancé, John McLaughlin. And they were going to get married while Robert was going to be in Venezuela. So therefore... I think this would be Christmas 1966. Everybody gathered together so we could get photos before Robert and Margaret left the country. So this is as close as Dad ever got to having his blended happy families one unit actually functioning. He got all his kids together on one day and we took the photo. And yeah, tensions were high between Mum and Betty, and Betty was constantly making sure that Sue and Robert didn't step out of line and be too friendly to my mum. And the old man was just doing his best, and you know, it, it never really occurred to him that he was going to have any difficulties setting up a Brady bunch. And that's about that same time I would have been six years old, and that's me on the right, Rex Linden on the left. His father was busy having mental health problems and, and uh, Rex's mother would quite often ask if we could take Rex away on holidays because you know, his father was going off and uh, it, it got Rex away from the domestic violence. His, other, his brothers would go to other families around the, the town. And there's my mother. This is an extremely rare photo. She's actually out in daylight and swimming. And she's holding still for the photo with most of it concealed by the surfboard and being in the water because she was big lady in those days. I mean, when she was married, she was overweight. But then I was what they call an experimental baby at Royal North Shore. She was under the care of some obstetrician that my dad's sister had dug out because she was a, a registered nurse working in Sydney and she used to specially nurse private nursing arrangements for rich people who were dying sort of thing and therefore she had connections with all of the expensive private doctors and she found an experimental obstetrician who was working on using oxytocin extracted from human pituitaries to induce births in women who should have had cesareans and my mother was one of them. So <clears throat> she was in and out of labour ward every day for 10 days and every day for 10 days they gave her a shot of human pituitary extract, they called it pitocin, to try and induce labour. And at the end of the 10 days, the old charge nurse said, look, darling, you're going to have a baby tonight, and gave her a double dose. And she indeed had a baby. And prolonged labour can cause death of a person's pituitary gland due to avascular necrosis because of the amount of time that no blood supply can get to the pituitary during uterine contractions. So mum came out of the hospital with a brand new baby and then she proceeded to get big and fat and her milk didn't come in and, and then they discovered she had a gallbladder problems and went off to have the gallbladder out and she just had endless health problems after I was born and a big part of it was because her pituitary gland had effectively died during my birth. Once she got the gallbladder sorted out, then she found herself in the hands of an experimental endocrinologist who was trying to stimulate women's or people's pituitaries when they weren't functioning at a good enough level. And uh, mum said his waiting room was full of men with tits and women with beards. And she found that disturbing. And he wanted to put her in a hospital so that he could take blood every day and fiddle with the levels of her pituitary hormones. And the doctor in Glen Innes had said to her, look, Mari, if you got run over by a car and I had to cut your leg off, you'd get used to the fact that you've only got one leg and you'd get on with your life. He said, you've had a baby and something's gone wrong and now you're fat. Why don't you just get used to the fact that you're fat and get on with your life? So she had that ringing in her ears and she's looking at these men with tits and women with beards and she said to the doctor, what guarantee can you give me that you can make me normal again, fix me up, or am I going to finish up like the women with beards? And he said, oh, no guarantees at all. It's all purely experimental. So she whipped out the 
bottle of pituitary stimulating drugs that he'd given her, put them on his desk and she said, well, thanks very much, but I think I'll go home and I'll learn to live with being fat, like the doctor in Glen Innes said. <coughs> so here she is when she was fat. And here she is about six years later when she'd gone on a brown rice diet to try and take some weight off because the endocrinologist had, I think I was about 10 or 11, he'd rung up the Glen Innes doctor to ask whether this particular patient was still alive because she was uh, one of the people who was on his experimental program and everybody else who had that drug had died of a pituitary tumour. And she'd walked out early on in the course and he just wanted to check up and see if she was still alive. And if she was, could they pull blood and see what her various pituitary hormone levels were? And when they found she had like a hundred times the normal level of prolactin, um, he wanted to chop her head open to see what was going on in there. And she decided to go on a brown rice diet and visit a chiropractor and have him adjust her back. And yeah, she's a lot skinnier in this photo than she was in this one. Or this one. Well, I fear we've had a pause button sequential failure in that, but anyway, you get the idea. Weight, weight, weight goes up, she diets really heavily, weight goes down. But it was a constant struggle for her. This is about a year and a half later when we're on our way back from. Lismore where they were trying to get me into Woodlawn when V. La Salle Armadale closed down during the, the fallout from the 1973 OPEC oil crisis when fuel prices went up and they couldn't afford to run the boarding school without increasing their fees and they were supposed to be a cheap boarding school so rather than become a rich boarding school they just closed the boarding side. That of course is uh, Karen and Betty and me and my mum. I'm going to guess this is about 1979 because that would be about the time of my father's 70th birthday party when we have Robert and Margaret, Linda, Sue, Linda's mother, Sue's my sister, my mother and me with my father on the front veranda of the house that mum and dad built at Lawrence Street because the William Street house was really, really old and put together on a shoestring during the Great Depression. And uh, yeah, he wanted a new house. His kids were all in new houses, so he wanted to live in a new house. There we go, look at that out of sequence. This would be about 1970 or 71 at the Land of the Beardies History House and Museum, where she's getting into weaving demonstrations. Probably about 1969 or 70 was when she started doing weaving courses at the Tech. Learned how to spin and weave. Dad started making spinning wheels and looms for her. And yeah, she was teaching spinning and weaving and bobbin lace right up until she died. House is still full of bobbin lace projects half done. Um, she wove me an Anatolian cape or a poncho out of alpaca wool. I think I'm going to wear it to the bloody funeral for her. Well, I didn't get a chance to wear it. The alpaca coat of many colours, I wore that to my son's wedding and she got to see me in that. But I, I think tomorrow I'll wear the Anatolian cape. Here she is in uh, period costume at the History House. I'm thinking 1970 at the opening of the History House or maybe a couple of years later at one of the annual fundings. It might be a car from the Hardman Brothers at Armadale. I couldn't tell you if it's a Lancia or not. Dad did do an awful lot of work on a difficult engine for them. He was very proud of it, so you know, yeah, they'd bring the car to Glen Innes and he would have photographed it with mum beside it. But that's just me reconstructing. And then she went to Weight Watchers. And yeah, that is my mother. When she and dad went on a overseas holiday, I think it was 1976. Uh, Hong Kong, Singapore and Japan. And some street photographer has snapped that shot and then tracked them down and sold them the picture. There he's got her on another day. Never really got down to this weight again until just before she died when she she did lose a lot of weight. But yeah, she might have been the biggest, fattest, heaviest woman in town when I was in kindergarten, but she didn't stay that way. She, she managed to take the weight off because it was a health thing. 
and she figured if she stayed big and fat and overweight then she wouldn't last long enough to see me finish school so therefore she dieted and it was ruthless dieting too my mother with her mother when my mother's brother uncle bert was getting married that would be probably 1975 ish sometime around there my mother and my father and the dog that my brother bought in Melbourne and flew to Brisbane and drove back down to Glen Innes to give to Dad because his old miniature fox terrier had died. So this would be not long after my mother's mother died. Oh. Don't quote me on that one. It could, could be, say, 1981-ish. I'm wanting to think. I know it's been taken by me with a Zenit photo sniper using a 300mm lens because their faces are in perfect focus and the wall behind them is out of focus, so I'm using a telephoto lens. And she wasn't really sure what this big camera was going to be like. Therefore, she's got a very querulous look on her face. She doesn't know whether I'm going to make her look like shit or not. I mentioned that Jeff Callaghan was one of the, uh, the few friends of my father who remained friends with him after he married my mum well that's jeff callaghan at dad's 70th birthday and mum looks like she's had a glass or two of wine she she never had a high tolerance for alcohol um she got quite happy drunk on one glass and and sometimes a little bit over over the top on two glasses yeah that would be 1982 a, a very late in the marriage photo taken at Red Rock by me when I had my first Zenit photo sniper. And Dad died in 1982 and then the Zen that Zenit got burnt in a, a... Or did it? No. The tent on the bike got burnt in the campfire. And I retained that camera. So that would be 1982, I'd say. Photo by me of my mother. And I don't know who took this one, but there's an awful lot of people who were in her class at school who will be able to relate to Mrs. Wharton looking and glowering pretty much like that. In the photo album, it's just captioned, at school, work. And yeah, here she is at Harry Kent's place. Harry Kent was in the Lions Club with Dad. And uh, when Dad died, she went with Harry Kent back to the house and grabbed all of Dad's books, which she thought were worth a lot of money, but they didn't actually have a publication date in them, so they were technically worth less. But she had fantasies that um, my siblings would come and try to steal stuff which had been left to her in the terms of Dad's will because she got his household goods because that's you know, part of the marriage vows. My worldly goods I thee endow sort of thing. So yeah, she, she hid some of Dad's books at Harry Kent's place and then Harry Kent's wife had died the previous year so they started making time and going out with each other and, and he became her special companion, she used to call him. She didn't like saying that she was his girlfriend because, yeah, she grew up in the 1940s and 50s and she was pretty old school. But, yeah. Again, at Harry Kent's place, using the electric spinning wheel that my father made, not entirely certain where this is, but these are my cousin Sue's twin boys. And my mother's taken them for a bit of a stroll in a, a tandem stroller. My mother and her big sister, Auntie Lane, mother of Sue and Richard. My mother and her boyfriend, Harry Kent, and Harry Kent's two nieces couldn't tell you what their first names are. Their last name was Myers, M-Y-O-R-S. And yeah, around about that point in time, um, 1980s, the old girl became a civil marriage celebrant. She'd already become a justice of the peace, more or less for the fun of it. And then she decided that it would be a good thing for her to become a marriage celebrant. I don't know who the first marriage was, or who, who the participants in the first marriage were, but um, this is Delhi Twig, 
daughter of Warwick Twigg, he was the librarian at the primary school where mum was the sewing teacher. So she slowly was working her way into the old local effect. And here she is with some kids that she's taught to spin and weave and they're showing off their prizes from the Royal Easter show. Because every time she did something good at the local show, she'd then get the best of it and send it off to Sydney so they could win big time statewide. Here she is with a couple of characters. There's a hen scratch that says she's with somebody and wife at the History House. But I'm afraid I don't recognise them and I can't tell you who the hell they are. But that's just downstream consequences of a fractured skull when I was 14 and crashing an aeroplane when I was 32. And there she is with Harry Kent, the special companion, the boyfriend, my de facto stepfather. They maintained separate addresses, but they were very close. Again with Harry Kent at the University of New England when mum's brother's wife, my auntie Rita, was collecting her PhD in musicology. And there we have my mother, her big sister, and her big brother celebrating Hardy Reader's PhD in musicology. And I don't know who this lady is, but I know that one in the green shirt. That's Ellen Shapiro. Ron Shapiro was my grandmother's doctor, an Englishman. His wife was an English nurse. And yeah, they got on so well with the family that, you know, this must be 20 years after my grandmother died. And they've gone to Armadale to watch Bert's wife get a PhD in musicology. Um, the whole family was really good at networking and remembering names and relationships and who's connected to who and who's done favours for who and all that. I'm afraid I have none of those skills. And here she is in the house at Lawrence Street, obviously propounding something weighty, telling us how it is. Um, while spinning on the spinning wheel that Dad made out of a Singer sewing machine. See the Singer sewing machine's drive wheel there? And the foot pedal? And the drive belt comes up and over the spindle? And uh, yeah, it's much more portable and easy to cart around and take on holidays with you than one of those old-fashioned horizontal sp uh, spinning wheels. And this is when Matthew was about 17, learning to drive, and she took him for a drive down to visit Uncle Bert when he was at his holiday place. Now, he was actually dying of prostate cancer at that point. And uh, he brought me some iron wood with the idea that I could make a walking stick for myself out of it. It was probably 150 years too young to make a proper red coloured iron wood walking stick out of it. There was only a tiny weeny little bit of red wood in the very centre of the sapling that he'd managed to find on the side of the road. So I left the sap wood on and I made a walking stick out of it and gave it straight back to him like three days after he dropped the wood off the walking stick was made and he got to use it in his final stages. Um, yeah, so mum took Matthew to visit Uncle Bert while he was dying. And if Matthew was driving when he was 17, and that means he was already a deputy captain in the New South Wales Rural Fire Service at that point, he was the youngest one they had on their books. Here we go, Mum and Bert. And that's Mum and Artie Lane, and I reckon that's pretty close to being as pissed as I've ever seen my mother in a photograph. She's pissed as in happy drunk. Unless it's the way she looks in this one. And this one, she's actually got the glass of champagne in the hand. It was very rare that you'd see mum, mum sufficiently affected by alcohol that you got to see this face. She was, she was normally a little bit more restrained than that. With, of course, Harry Kent and Artie Lane, and I'd say this would be Harry's 80th birthday. And here she is uh, 32 years ago with my daughter Elizabeth. This would be 1994 when uh, they thought she had a pituitary tumour. So we were off to Sydney for a magnetic resonance imaging session. And uh, the report that came back said that in her pituitary fossa there was a mass 10.5 millimetres by 
both by 10 millimeters by 9.5 millimeters with no projections on the superior aspect. And what that means is that there was a lump in the little bony fossil where the pituitary normally resides, but the artery, the vein, the nerve, and the lymphatic vessel that's supposed to stick up from the top of the pituitary, the, uh, the infundibulum, as it's called, the little stalk that the pituitary hangs on, it was not present or visible in, in the MRI or the CT scan. And uh, my theory is that the experimental obstetrician with his human pituitary extract, he managed to kill her pituitary when I was being born. The experimental endocrinologist with his pituitary stimulating hormone that killed everybody other than my mother who took it, he started a slow growing hormonally active pituitary tumour which caused her to have major problems with weight fluctuations and amenorrhea and crazy pituitary levels of hormone levels all of my childhood. And then by this stage, the pituitary tumour wrapped around its own infundibulum and strangled its own blood supply. And yeah, she noticed a few signs and symptoms of that at this point. We took her off to Sydney and once again, they said, well, look, we could learn a lot more by chopping your head open than we could ever hope to fix once we get in there. So at this point, she went off to um, a sort of a natural therapy clinic and paid them $100 a day to feed her on distilled water and fruit juice for a month. And for a while there, she lost a lot of weight and she was off all of the medications, but they didn't want her to eat meat. And she was a meat eater. So she came home and she gradually started buying very expensive organic meat and, and that did for the taste thing, but it was too expensive. And before you knew it, she was back on a meat diet and she was back on all the usual tablets and all the rest of it. But yeah, this was part of the, the struggle with her ongoing health issues because of my childbirth and her giving birth to me. And regards the joke of I'm not silly, it's just the way my mother dresses me. Yeah, she made that jumper hand spun, hand knitted, and she made those trousers too, hand tailored in grey moleskin. By that stage I got to the point where if she wants to make my bloody clothes, I will wear them and, you know, feel happy that I've got a mother who can make clothes for me. Everybody else has to buy theirs from Levi. Me and me mother and me kids. Uh, that would be probably 1995 or 96. Look at that. I've got a black beard. Black moustache too. Here she is at the history house several years ago i think it might be not long after she put on a big fundraising fashion parade that's mary hollingsworth with her in the middle um, they didn't have a lot to do with one another and, and you know, i don't know what stories mary hollingsworth tells about mum but mum had a few to tell about mary hollingsworth of course mum taught mary hollingsworth as a, as a school kid so you know she could go back a ways and i i know the face of this lady but i, I can't put a name to it once again. Blame the Dodgem car skull fracture or the aeroplane knock on the head, crashing the ultralight. And, well, this, this isn't the most recent Anzac Day, but she did make it to Anzac Day. I took her down there and walked her out and laid the wreath for her. Because her father was in the Australian Flying Corps for two years, she was very, very keen that there should be a wreath laid at Anzac Day to commemorate the men and machines of the Australian Flying Corps. And when she got too old and feeble to be able to bend down and put the wreath on the ground, I started taking her to Anzac Day and doing the hard bits for her. Um, her father never fought in the First World War. It wasn't until um, about August 1918 that he got anybody to notice the fact or acknowledge the fact that he had a 1917 vintage pilot's licence issued by the Royal Aero Club of Sydney. Number 96 in Australia. But either because he left school at age 12 or for some other reason, um, they wouldn't take him on as a pilot until he got to England 
and he kept going into hospital with a bad back every time they tried to send him to France. And uh, yeah, finally he was accepted for pilot training in the Australian Flying Corps and he didn't finish that until March 1919 when he went to Buckingham Palace and he was invested with his wings by King of England, which turned him into a ardent monarchist for the rest of his life and he raised my mother to be an ardent monarchist for all of her life to the point where she has requested that we commence her funeral with God save the Queen unless Prince Charles had already ascended to the throne in which case it was to be God save the King I'm the only one who seems to want to do that tomorrow and I don't know whether it's going to happen but I think it should I think in her mind she wanted everybody to settle down in the church and then have God save the Queen played and they'd all have to stand up one more time for Queen Elizabeth II, her heirs and successors and duly appointed minions. Because, as I understand it, in my mother's mind, her and Elizabeth Windsor were the only two people on the whole planet who were 100% right in every matter, every time, no matter what the issue was. Everybody else was not quite as correct as Queen Elizabeth and my mother. And I'm pretty sure that the reason my wife named my daughter Elizabeth was to give my mother the shits because my wife knew that my, my mother and my big sister couldn't stand a bar of each other. But you know, such is life. When you try to uh, blend the families together, it, it, it never goes smoothly. And I prefer having a good relationship with my children, so therefore I have never, ever tried to repartner because I would not inflict a stepmother fantasy on my kids. And apart from anything else, I've got what they call a quiet shit magnet effect, which means that the next girlfriend fantasy will be slightly worse than the next one, uh, than the last one. If I look at my wife and I look at the girlfriend I had before my wife, I can talk to her. Now I've taken... The girlfriend I had before my wife, I've taken her to funerals. I see her in the main street, I talk to her, we say good day, we don't have any drama. When I see my wife, I put my head down and I hope she doesn't recognise me because I don't want to be around for the screaming shit fight scene that she will put on wherever it is that she sees me. So you put your ruler on top of the ex-girlfriend's head, you put it on top of my wife's head, and the, the trajectory is down. The next one's going to be worse. And I'm not big on blended families, you know. I tried being a stepfather once. Silliest thing I ever did. On the other hand, I've got two lovely kids because I was, well, I am married to my children's mother. But by Jesus, it was a rough deal for her kids. They got stuck with me as a stepfather, and... I reverted to the way I was raised as a kid and my father raised me with a stock whip so I became the stepfather from hell. I really did. And of course, you know, my surviving stepson has absolutely nothing to do with me just like my mother's stepchildren had nothing to do with her. Unlike my mother, I don't think it's the stepkid's fault. She reckons she never did anything wrong and any ill will or bad feeling was obviously their fault, not hers. Yeah, my mother never did nursing training. She learned how to sew. I did nursing training. I describe nursing training, general nursing training, as remedial therapy in being human. If I had not been a nurse, I would probably be fully signed up beside my mother and, and you know, standing at the door of the church to exclude my half-siblings in case they wanted to show up and say something. Instead, I had to have a fight with my mother's favourite niece over whether we could even mention Betty, Robert and Sue on the funeral brochure. And yeah, why shouldn't they get a mention? You know, she was their stepmother. I got the photo to prove it, you know. She tried her hardest to be a good stepmother according to her lights. The fact that they didn't want her as a stepmother. They didn't want a stepmother. They wanted just to have their relationship with their father. Yeah, that never ended her calculations. It certainly never ended Susie's calculations. Susie, my cousin. As far as she's concerned, Auntie Mari said this and Auntie Mari said that, and therefore we don't ever question it because, well, you saw the photo. Sue was maybe well, 1960. She would have been nine years old. The flower girl at my mother's wedding. 
My mother was her favourite auntie because, yeah, Auntie Lee had a moment. She, you couldn't ever say Auntie Lee was a favourite auntie. Um, so, yeah. Hopefully the family fights are starting to settle down a bit. Hopefully my cousin from Sydney won't want to replace mum's fight with my sister with a whole new generation of her fighting with me, but you never know. You know that my mother and her siblings were the, the sort of people who would fight like cats and dogs viciously among themselves, but if anybody else said anything about any of them, they would all weld themselves together and take on the interloper and you know, do their best to beat them into submission. Um, I just didn't grow up in that sort of a family. You know? My big sister was my big sister and then she got married and then I was an only child and then I went to boarding school. And yeah. Now I have kangaroos as breakfast gifts. And I'm... I've got a homecoming daughter who's going to come and live in a tent in my backyard. So everything changes. But anyway, I have no idea if anybody will watch this or wade through it to the end. But I feel I sort of should put something up on the YouTube channel to fill in the dots, fill in the blanks, join the dots, cross the T's. Um, yeah. Yeah, Dad had his first heart attack when I was about 13. So I spent most of my teenage years waiting for my father to die, which he did when I was 21. And I've, yeah, well, it would be 15 years since the old girl was treated for non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, and I've been more or less expecting her to fall off the perch any time from then on. And I've, yeah, put in the last seven years or so Propping her up so that she didn't need to go into a nursing home. Because the way my de facto stepfather left his will, it was sort of carefully designed so that Centrelink could never take my mother's savings in the form of a house or anything like that to pay for her potential nursing home costs. So... She used her life savings to build a house on her boyfriend's land. And she trusted her boyfriend to leave that land with her house on it to my son, which he did. He also left my son and my daughter a chunk of money, which they came into when they turned 25. But he left his 57 acres with my mother's house on it to my son which I was always a bit dirty on because I don't think my daughter ever did anything at age 11 to deserve being disinherited by her de facto grandfather, but my mother could be very simple-minded in some matters and my daughter looks a lot like my wife. Therefore, my mother prognosticated and decided that my daughter would side with my wife and my mother didn't want my wife getting her hands on anything that had ever been an asset of my mother's. The house was built on Bardwell, therefore my mother trusted Matthew to have nothing to do with his mother. He hasn't talked to her since he was 18. Um, and yeah, Matthew got the house on the land at Bardwell. And Elizabeth is coming up here to live on this place. And should I die before my wife, my wife will own this place, holus, bolus, lock, stock and barrel. Because that's the kind of title deed that this idiot put the place into when this idiot was trying to demonstrate his commitment to the marriage when such commitment was being questioned just after I came into 125,000 bucks and I was buying the title deed. So yeah, I turned my toes up. Presumably my wife will come down here and want to live with our daughter and that means Elizabeth will have her house on her mother's place and hopefully my daughter will outlive her mother and her mother won't sell this place up for some other stupid reason. Because at the moment my wife lives at Stanthorpe on one acre and she lives in a converted school bus and she has a shipping container with all her household goods in the shipping container. 
A worst case scenario is Matthew won't be able to come here and collect firewood because he doesn't get along well enough with his mother. Who knows how that one's going to work out. Maybe now that he's executive of executor of my mother's estate, going to move into Bardwell come August when his lease in Glen Innes runs out. Maybe he will unbend sufficiently to make some kind of fence mending effort with his mother and you know I feel like my father cherishing hopes and daydreams of a happy family is ending to the whole scenario don't know whether it's ever going to happen but one can but hope isn't that right okay that'll have to do it I will now go and start um, trying to put together a more permanent place for my daughter's batteries and jury rig current existing solar panels to go over and uh, reconnect it up to the yurt where she is going to be living in the future. Well, there you go, and there you know. That gives you a bit of a window into my antecedents and past doings, where I come from and how I come to be the way I am. If my mother wanted me to grow up to be a normal person, she should have raised me a whole lot differently. That's all I can say. Warbles on a lot to YouTube. Take it easy, fellas. Ciao.